Today we're taking a Gearling Engineering road trip to the Super Tower. So the Super Tower, this, uh, I noticed that there's hundreds of cables, I don't know if hundreds, at least dozens of cables coming into it. You know, a lot of times I see towers like this and you just think like there's one antenna or something, but yeah. obviously that's not the case that here. That is not this case in this one. That's so sure. what, like what's going on here? Why are there so many cables? Well, we call this the Super Tower back from shortly after it was built because uh, back in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, mostly there'd be like one purpose for the tower, an AM tower, FM towers. And uh, this one was built to do a lot. And it was built to do multiple FMs into the same antenna. So that became a thing when uh, people started building houses around our antenna sites. And we wanted to be in the center of population. So we made a, uh, a single tower, put a bunch of stations on it. It solves the problem. Instead of having 10 or 12 uh, towers in the landscape around us, we have one tower, a super tower, that does a lot. So number one, the FM antennas are at the very top and it's, it's two antennas combined, 10 radio stations now broadcast in that, give great coverage to the market. It's super coverage actually, so again, the super tower. Uh, and then the rest of the signals are either independent services that just happen to locate here, 911, FBI, whatever they would have here, uh, whatever the tower owner can sell and lease, and the rest of it is supporting the broadcasters uh, so there's data uh, exchange, internet uh, connections, satellite receives, a lot of two-way operators can be here, cellular is on there. So I noticed on, on the base here, it's really, really narrow for all the weight that this tower has. Yeah. I don't know how that's even physically possible. Yeah. But I also saw some <laughs> grounding straps or something here. Can you explain what those are for? And I remember you, you at an AM station, there was something different about the way that this works, but like, what's this for? Yeah, so on the uh, tower, the grounding is number one, some antennas, you, the grounding system here is for safety uh, lightning ground. So you want the, the lightning to hit the tower, come as fast down as it can and get to the ground and not try to travel into the building or along any cables. So every, every cable that goes up the tower is grounded to the tower and the tower is grounded with a system here with multiple rods uh, around the base. This piece is, it's rounded underneath. It's rounded and sits on a place, and some of them have at least a little cup spot, but that's the hole, but it allows the tower to move if it has to. And if you look up, you've got the guy wire systems actually pull hard to make, create great pressure right here so there's no movement. So the guy wire system is critical to have the right tension, the right cable, and all and the right points of uh, contact uh, so that the, the the system is pulling equally on every leg and this this point here is pulled straight down whether it's a rack of servers or not or it's a bunch of equipment on a tower everybody thinks about cable management so you can see here the cable management goes in some go down some go straight in and of course in the building you got the same thing so we can go inside and see what's on the other end of a lot of these cables come on in You can already see some wires are coming overhead here. I'm yes. guessing other ones go below. Yeah, if you go, uh, if you come into this room here, so you can see a lot of the cables that come in here, and you can see the big master FM antenna system. The cables come through here to go up the tower. Those look serious. Are they like pressurized? <laughs> and they are pressurized, and they're carrying like in kilowatts. The antenna ra radiates almost a megawatt, right? It's like a it's an eight, nine, 900 and something thousand watts, but inside the RF going up is probably 300 or something like that. We went inside the transmitter room for Y98, a 90,000 watt FM station serving St. Louis, and I asked my dad to explain how the sound comes into the building and how it goes from the studio all the way through to that million watt antenna system. Out on the tower or from underground fiber, audio comes into this place, and by now in uh, current day, all the audio is processed before it gets here because it's digitized, so you don't have to worry about any artifacts getting introduced in the path. So you have digital audio coming across from the studio, wherever it is on the planet, and uh, comes into this room, uh, transfers over, and it'll, it'll go, uh, one set of audio will go to the HD transmitter, and one will go to the analog transmitter. And the HD transmitter is 
often is a pre-done group of packets, all IP, that just goes into the transmitter. You can see these are the two HD carriers that are being sent out of the transmitter. There's no analog carrier which sits in the middle. So the analog carrier at this site is sent from a different transmitter and they're mixed at the antenna up on the tower. So this transmitter is a water-cooled transmitter, this particular one. You can see the water system there, but the copper pipe is the, uh, is the transmission out here. It's about 30,000 watts of RF. It'll come out and it'll go through a switching system. It goes through a switching system and a dummy load for testing goes downstairs to the basement. Uh, both of these transmitters go down. And obviously the HD carriers use a lot less total power, and that's why they can use a smaller uh, cable. But you got a 400 amp service comes in the building. We got a generator switch over there to switch in either uh, the building power or the generator power. Some sites like this will have a single site generator. It'd be like a megawatt generator. Uh, but it, when this site was built, each station was on their own, and they still are. Uh, so you'll see multiple generators out here, different sizes, depending on what the needs of that station is or that company. And a transformer here, I don't know if you can see that one, a transformer that takes that 480 down to the levels we need it to be. And then it feeds this group of panels, big switches, for, uh, that feed all the transmission, uh, uh, transmitters, racks. So let's say the, the power of the building is cut. So this UPS will kick in right away and then yes. run both the, the uh, analog and the digital and no, everything else? It won't run the analog transmitter because that alone is, uh, that would be too much to have one. And remember, this service is three rooms here. So this is all the uh, computerized and audio gear, keep it running so the transmitter will be up when the generator kicks on 10 seconds later and everything will be back to normal. So this basically keeps the audio running but yeah. the transmitter will have to kick off and then kick back on when the generator kicks in. Yeah, all the audio gear and the remote control gear, which is all computerized now. It's all IP-based stuff. So back in the back corner here, I see the two pipes. I'm guessing one is the main analog and yep. one is the backup analog. Yep. And then it looks like HD just kind of goes right past that yep. weird little R2-D2 bucket. Right, right. So, yeah, what, so is, what does that do? So this is a switch to allow us to switch either transmitter out to the load, which it goes down to, out to the antenna, which is down here. The other transmitter comes out the other port and it goes to our dummy load. It's a 50,000 watt dummy load. So we can be testing and preparing one transmitter while the other one's on the air. And you said there was one dummy load that's actually outside. This is a dummy load that used to dissipate a lot of RF. It would get very hot. And so the wise engineer of this company put this baby outside, weatherproof box, gets hot, doesn't heat the room up where he has to air condition it. Because I'm yeah. guessing if you pump 50,000 watts into this thing, yeah. that probably gets fairly when, hot. When you're testing, all of a sudden both air conditioners will run at full power to keep it cool in here because you're dumping 30 kilowatts into that uh, dummy load. And it's just, it's a bunch of resistors in there. It just gets hot like a toaster. So we have in this particular transmitter, a rare sighting of an FM transmitter that is water cooled. Uh, TV guys have done this for decades. Uh, but it's kind of new on the FM side. So you've got two pumps, but you've got an in and an out. There's a, it circulates out, and, it, and most of the heat gets dissipated out there to a fan system. And then the water comes back in, goes through the transmitter, comes back out, gets pumped through the units out there. So we keep an eye on the intake and output pressure, and you have two pumps. Either one can make it, the system work. And just like on your uh, furnace downstairs, you got that little bladder control thing to help you with the uh, water. We have two transmitters and two antenna systems. One is the main antenna. If they're ever working on that, Y98 here has actually a second antenna on the tower. And so we have, it takes two switches to switch the two transmitters to either antenna. And then one of them is always end up in the dummy load. One of the antennas on, the, on this tower, one of many, uh, feeds these receivers through those filter cans we talked about, which we have some spare stuff down here, you can see. These used to be the standard way we would do live broadcast. We'd be out in our van, whip up that mask, shoot it to hit the antenna on the tower, it would come through here, go through a circuit back to the studio, and we would pot it up and be live. So we, these frequencies were the ones that were we used to do our live broadcast. So I see that the, like, the little pipe coming out is teeny tiny, it gets bigger, and bigger, yeah. and then all of a sudden there's this giant power monitor. Yeah. How, why is it all these weird pipes? Like, it, usually when you see so, copper like this, you think water. Yeah, so 
the, the cable, uh, this cable, they all has loss, right? So when you leave a transmitter at 600 watts, if your cable is too small and the, and the loss is too great, you gotta run a couple hundred feet, you might only have 80 or 100, 200 watts at the other end of it. So you wanna have some sort of calculated loss. So in this case, uh, a bigger line was chosen for the long run down to the basement and across to the antenna. And you can follow the path from the transmitter to see this one. So transmitter two is going to dummy load. Transmitter one is going out to here, going out to here and up to the main antenna. All right, so we're in the basement of the building. And you remember upstairs where the pipes went through the floor. So we're gonna pick that up here and you can see the thicker pipe, the three inch is the analog uh, transmitter. And then the HD transmitter is the little stuff there. And you can follow these and uh, they will take you all the way over here to this box. So every station upstairs has a combiner module so they can mix together and form one RF uh, path for all the stations up the tower. So if you look down here where the, the end station is, the inputs go, they add up as they go along. So down here you got smaller cable, jumpering in and out, and then all of a sudden you need a bigger cable you can see at the very end, it's uh, the huge piece that all the energy of all the stations is going into that port. So this system is also an antenna switcher, it just has more RF to deal with. So you've got the, uh, this is actually a switch. So if you get, I don't know if you can get in there and see it, but there is the four port switch, just like we saw upstairs for the stations, only this is like a nine inch version of the same thing. So you can see it's got a controller here so that we can switch the analog and the digital antennas, upper and lower, and so we switch them through this thing depending on what trouble we're having up there or even if we're just having regular maintenance at the top of the tower. But this is version three of the monitoring system, and so all the stations here that go in, uh, this monitors their forward power coming into the system, it monitors all their output power uh, on another screen, it's going out the antenna, triggers alarms and, and alerts people uh, individually, or as a group to issues that are going on out here. You said that there's a megawatt at the antenna, but adding all these numbers up doesn't quite get there. Yeah, so, so the antenna system on this tower has a gain factor. It's probably around four. And so uh, the number of bays on an antenna go from, you know, you put a kilowatt in, you get a kilowatt out of coverage. Uh, but if you have two or three or four bays, you can, you can increase the amount of coverage you get putting on the same amount of power in. You get a rare look at the end of a used uh, piece of this coax. So just like your coax you use for your car antenna or radio or whatever you've got at home that uses coax, outer conductor, inner conductor, and then these are Teflon spacers to keep it in the center. Uh, and then air flows through, and they're usually pressurized to keep them dry so there's no arcing. So you mentioned that there's air inside of that tube instead of the coax Yes. giant coax tube keeping it dry air but you need it dry air, so that's what this is for that's what the nitrogen so these are all nitrogen tanks and because there's so much line and it's so big uh, we have multiple tanks backing each other up you can see everything is monitored they're monitoring the upper two uh, the analog two and the digital two uh, uh, cables that go up the tower monitor the pressure making sure it stays within the realm uh, where it's supposed to and they end up going out the out the plastic at the top and you, they go all the way across to the lines over there, uh, connect into the lines that go up the building and outside. So here's where they're injected. You can see the injection points yep. of the line. And each one has a little pressure monitor on yeah, it. Yeah, secondary monitor if your electronics goes dead, computer goes dead. Safety is a major concern with a tower that pumps out a million watts of RF. And just like with electrical systems, they have special RF lockouts to make sure tower climbers don't get killed when they do their work. So these are for the upper and lower half of the antenna. So the antenna system has two four bay antennas. And when everything's right, they're both on, they're both working. But if something happened to one or the other, a leak in the line up on the tower or a bay that arced out, uh, then they would shut down that half and all the stations would still transmit but only through half the antenna, either the upper or the lower half. The purpose of this guy is safety for the tower crew mainly. It's a lockout. When you pull this, you actually run a short across the inside of the conductor. So you would have a lot of smoke and fire uh, if, that, if everything was on. So the idea is everything's off and it's gonna stay off. So once they pull this, lock them out. Uh, when it's locked out, no one can turn their transmitter on without seeing a short. 
And so the transmitters these days shut off real quick and it's all good. So they got a, a connection point outside, comes underground, comes into this building and it distributes this power bus inside of here. And then over the years they've had to add a couple more meters. Then they got main building distribution uh, points here to get power to the cooling and other systems in the building. So you know there were a lot of big stations and big coax and big stuff. There's also, as you can see coming in here, a lot of smaller stuff comes in and these are for different kind of communication devices. Everything from two-way radios, antennas, digital two-way radios, small uh, FM transmitters from 1985. This is the communications area that come, comes in from companies like AT&T and so forth and goes out to all the rooms upstairs and downstairs. And so you can see the aging. You know, we had the T1 era, uh, copper era was started with. You could see that disappearing. Uh, and then T1, and now we got fiber everywhere. No, 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 no. Nobody plugs into the UPSs that are for a specific purpose, right? So no, you don't just plug into a UPS. Because that controls the fiber for the whole building. Yes, that would be the fiber probably for the whole building, probably on that UPS. Yeah, fiber scissors only. Another major safety feature is the tower lights. At nighttime, it's impossible to see a tower if the lights aren't working, so my dad showed me one of the burnt out bulbs and talked about how they make sure the lights are always working. These tower sites have lights for safety. They get monitored, uh, and nowadays there's centers around the country. So you sign up, you register, you put your uh, lights in to be monitored, or you have someone locally, the local engineers monitored. The super tower, technically called the FM master tower, has a lot of history. And my dad was one of the engineers there at the beginning. I asked him a little bit about how things changed over the years. So when this tower was built, that was around the time I was born. Yeah. Were you involved in setting up the initial stuff that went on to it? Yeah, yeah, I got involved in it. Uh, I remember standing over there when they dug, dug the hole out. Um, the first the building was empty except for four rooms. So you had everything we just walked through, the basement had about a third of what's down there now. And there were like four rooms that had activity. The rest of them were just blank rooms. And it's amazing to me to see, so all these cables and all the antennas, all these satellite dishes, when we went through here, there was like a TV station that came and went. There were radio stations that have come and gone. Yeah. Some of them have switched from using satellite for sources to using IP over the internet. Yeah. Some of them are using 4G. There's little, you call them mushrooms, little antennas up on the roof. Yeah. You can barely see a couple of them for GPS and things. Yeah. So all these different things come and go, but I think it's amazing how one tower, this super tower, can have tens, dozens, I don't know, over the years, hundreds of different antennas and, and transmissions go through it. Yeah, a lot of dreams that started big and then failed, uh, but a lot of dreams that came through and, and served their purpose and they're done. So, uh, but they do, that's a constant thing. Every tower owner, which is now that they're usually bigger companies, but every tower owner has had to do that. When a guy leaves your tower, do you take his cable down? Do you leave it up for another tenant, maybe rent it? So this site's been very good about uh, keeping track, keeping an eye on it. Uh, rebuilding, redoing, maintenance, all that stuff. So it's been a, it's what we call it the super site, super tower, St. Louis's super tower.